Hello and welcome to this Quaker Focus program on the testimony of integrity. I'm Michael Winter and during this program I'll be joined by Graham French, David Minifee and Margaret Mowat Carver, three other Christchurch Quakers. The testimony of integrity and truth refers to the way that Quakers try to live their belief that we need to live a life that is true to the highest, what many people call God, within ourselves and true to others. To Quakers, this idea includes personal, wholeness and consistency, as well as honesty and fair dealing in our business affairs. It isn't just about telling the truth, it's about applying truth to each situation. Some of the spin-offs of this testimony include the reputation Quakers have established for honesty and fair dealing in business, as well as a refusal to swear oaths. This led to the right for witnesses to affirm in courts of law. So I'd like to kick off by thinking about how the testimony arose and what its impacts have been on Quakers and their society over the years. Margaret, do you want to kick off? Well, George Fox was very much against uh, the way in which the, the church in general was run at the time, and he felt that there was little integrity within it. So he was, he was extremely passionate, and he was the driving force the driving force in his life at that time was for complete integrity. Integrity. Now this, of course, is always a difficult thing, but uh, with a passion that defies logic, he demanded for himself and for others a life of holy obedience in even the smallest detail of life. So George Fox actually started this movement from what he saw as being totally useless um, as far as the, the present churches were concerned. So George was the, the founder of the Quakers and he lived in England in, in, the, 16, yes. in the 17th century, 1640, yes. 1650. Yes, he did. Yeah. Okay. I think he would have been locked up if he was around today. Why would he have been locked up? He would have been seen as sort of mentally deranged, I think. But he did get locked up a few times, didn't he? Yes. Well, yeah, well that was also another, the way the society treated Quakers because... Um, of Quakers' refusal to swear oaths, which was George Fox took that both from the Bible and from the idea of that you say yes and it is yes, and you say no, it is no, you tell the truth at all times. So swearing an oath meant there was two sorts of truth, which was not either biblical or uh, speaking with integrity. So George Fox and a lot of Quakers were locked up because they refused to swear oaths, so they would not swear oath to the king, an oath of allegiance. They got around this to a degree because they were also pacifists, so they said, we we do not go to war, we would not fight against the king. So it depended. Sometimes they got locked up and sometimes they didn't. But also, with a refusal to swear oaths meant they couldn't go into business. They couldn't obviously go to war because they wouldn't swear allegiance to the king and they were also pacifists. But because they wouldn't swear oaths, they, could, they, they were restricted in how they would earn their living. So the early Quakers were quite inventive and went into areas like pharmaceuticals, chocolate, shoes, and they also started some trends today like setting fair prices for business, because before the Quakers went into business, everyone haggled for the price of something if it was being sold. So Quakers set fair prices, which meant, and they also treated everyone fairly, and so it meant that people could send children down to buy things from a Quaker shop, and they would just pay a fair price and would not be taken advantage of. It would be a fixed price too, as opposed to a price that would be arrived at by haggling. But there's a spin-off, of course, about this failure to take oaths, because to go to university in Britain, well, in England anyway, which meant Oxford and Cambridge, until the University of London was founded, you had to swear an oath of allegiance to the Church of England. So that precluded Quakers from university education. Now, the interesting side to that was that the Quakers tended to have their own schools and whereas the English tradition was a classical education, the 
Quaker schools taught a more modern scientific education, which led, as David has said, to Quakers going into business and doing very well. Uh, so in the 18th century, they dominated steel making and iron, the iron industry. They were involved, I think, in Stevenson's first railway. And because of this reputation for honesty, fair dealing and integrity, the first main banks in Britain were set up by Quakers. So Lloyd's and Barclays were set up by Quakers as an adjunct to their other businesses because they could be trusted to look after people's money. Mm -hmm. But of course, nowadays, not many of these old, old Quaker businesses are still run by Quakers and on Quaker principles, are they? I doubt it. I think once businesses ceased to be family owned and became public businesses then they would eventually have been taken over mm. uh, so Cadbury's I think ceased to be a Quaker business about the Second World War Roundtree's about the same time. Talking about that scientific thing it's um, besides the Quakers being involved in things like pharmaceuticals and steel making John Dalton who was the founder of the atomic theory um, was a well-known Quaker and was part of the um, Lunar Society um, near Birmingham, which was a group of um, scientists who used to meet every full moon. They used to travel, and, and uh, he, he was a prominent member of that little group. But he was a Quaker. Also, with the education, women had far more of a chance at the time to have some education and to be respected for what they could do. Uh, so there, there was more of a, an equality amongst Quakers because we each take responsibility for who we are and what we do and how mm -hmm. we act. So it's not just a matter of having a hierarchy uh, with the men commanding what should be done and how it should be done, or the, the little woman at home. And I'm sure that you know often that was necessary because of children in any case, but the fact was that, that women had far more equality. And also their own experiential wisdom and this is something that grows with us as we we get older, as we as we go through life. Our wisdom just we're not born with it, and we learn a lot from who is around us. But the experiment, experiential wisdom, which means what you have experienced in your life, and is is really important. So that it in turn relates to the integrity because you then have some knowledge of what you want to do and how you want to do it and why. But of course this changes because as you find this new knowledge and there is everywhere around us new knowledge these days. So that um, it is, it is, a, it is a, a growing thing, the integrity, what we think, how we think and just being a Quaker is a, is a whole growing thing. It, it's changed over many years. Mm. So it's not like a, a, a sort of fixed creed. Absolutely Testimonies not. are a, a living, growing things that arise out of our own experience of yes. life and, and our own experience of spirit. Yes. yes. I was going to say my first introduction to Quakers, I was impressed by the wisdom of the woman, older woman in the meeting. And I don't think that has changed. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be doing a program on equality um, fairly soon too so we'll be talking about gender equality but also racial equality mm -hmm. and other um, ages and stuff like that too yeah. well the active role of women in the Quakers was one of the consequences of the men being imprisoned so women actually ran the show while most of the men were locked up mm -hmm. women and children yes yeah yeah and they were pretty dire sort of prisons as well, weren't they? It wasn't something you would um, thrive in. And that was one of the reasons why Quakers became so involved in prison reform. The other thing was that by today's standards, Quakers weren't always pure because there were Quakers involved in the slave trade. There was even a Quaker ship called the Willing, a slave trading ship called the Willing Quaker. But once the Quakers realised the error of the slave trade, they were quick to um, do an about turn and, and they in fact were ahead of Wilberforce in moving the, for the abolition of slavery. Mm -hmm. mm. So how does this testimony affect us in our daily lives? Well you can try 
and fall short. You know, we're not. I can't say that I'm I'm goody goody two shoes. Mm-hmm. It, life just isn't quite like that. But we keep going and trying in that direction, and we try to be tender with other people too, who are also finding that they fall short from time time to time. And sometimes we're the only ones who know that we've fallen short, not somebody else out there that's going to criticise us. And that's, I think, where the matter of integrity comes in as well. It's not what you do on Sunday. It's the Quaker part of you. That's part of your whole life and what you do. It's not what you do behind the scenes. It's what you do on an everyday basis. It's a way of thinking, really. I don't think anyone is uh, truly consistent. Um, I, I'm reminded of uh, this idea of Gandhi's, that there should be a unity of ends and means. In other words, the um, means do not justify the end. And integrity is not a thing you make a song and dance about or, or brag about. I'm, uh, there's a beautiful quote I came across once, which I think bears this out. The louder he talked of his honour, the faster we counted the spoons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I found the idea of integrity in business, I still find it intriguing. Because speaking as um, an ex-businessman, I had a makeup business for a number of years. And it was interesting running a business with integrity and in that I treated everybody well, from my landlord to my staff and to my customers. And And in choosing my staff, I chose them on the basis of excellence. And so at one point, over half my staff were either dyslexic or dyspraxic, which would be unusual in a business, but they tended to be more creative as well as being excellent. But um, then my landlord loved me because I paid the rent on time. (laughs) So, I mean, it wasn't... You know, there's always frictions within a business, but just treating people well seemed to make it a little easier on the whole. (laughs) Some of the um, old, large Quaker businesses used to take that a long way with treating their workers well, like the Cadbury's established Bourneville Village Trust for accommodating their workers. And I'm not sure how today that would go down in terms of, you know, attitudes to paternalism and stuff. But um, that was something that they did. They were also ahead of most other businesses. Well, all the main Quaker businesses involved in chocolate, so the Cadbury's and the Roundtree's, were ahead of their day in terms of reducing the um, length of the working week, providing paid holiday, having sort of superannuation, Mm -hmm. sort of... Uh, workers were able to have shares and, and so on. But the Roundtrees had problems at one stage because Quakers are opposed to gambling and the Roundtrees had uh, almost a riot on their uh, hands when the staff wanted to go to the York races and they wanted the day off and uh, the Roundtrees being opposed to gambling didn't want to allow them and in the end they had to back down and give them a day off. Right. <laughs> I wonder why it is that Quakers went into, into chocolate making in such a big well, way. Well, chocolate um, started with cocoa, which was a great temperance drink. And uh, in the 19th century, Quakers were very much involved in the temperance movement. Although it's, there's not much said about in the Quaker histories, they were also involved in some of the brewing businesses. Mm-hmm. And the idea was that it was better for people to drink beer, which would be quality beer, than gin. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... Is it all summed up in this idea of innocent trades? If you couldn't be involved in munitions making or anything to do with war, then you look for alternatives. So in Britain in the 19th century, chocolate and cocoa making, cabbage, fries, round trees, biscuit making, Huntley and Palmers and so on, all those industries were dominated by Quakers. What, what I find interesting now is a movement towards ethical business. And so I think there's a conference going on in Australia of of, um, people involved in ethical business and there is a Quakers and Business organisation in England. I don't know, it seems to me that a lot of Quakers are more involved 
in being advisors rather than being businessmen. But obviously some of the Quaker ideals have transferred over to the ethical nature of business and it seems that these ethical businesses are now starting to thrive. The other point is I'm one of the trustees of a, a national Quaker trust here which tries to invest ethically and we have found that the return on ethical investment isn't actually less than that on sort of conventional investments over the long term. Mm -hmm. So the ethical investment, the current ethical investment movement, to what extent do their aims and values align with the Quaker principles, of testimonies of integrity, etc.? Yeah, well, I think they have, they're, they're very close, I know, particularly in sustainability, which I gather we'll be coming to. Yeah. If you and the movement like against um, coal and oil and gas. Uh, for the sustainability of our planet. So I think the ethical ideas are definitely aligned with the Quaker testimonies. So things tend to move along, like we were saying a little bit earlier on about values evolving with time, um, testimonies evolving, evolving with time, because in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, when Quakers were building their businesses then, they were in things like steel making and so on, which uh, tended to be nowadays frowned upon because of their environmental pollution. And if you go to uh, Ironbridge and Colebrookdale, you can see the bedlam iron furnaces, which were apparently horrendous in terms of environment. I can recall, recall seeing a picture of a, Abraham, a painting of Abraham Darby's ironworks and seeing the flames and the smoke mm. and the huge amount of pollution mm. that was caused by it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I think um, were the Quakers were also involved in the potteries. Was the Wedgwood I think Wedge, I'm here? pretty sure the Wedgwoods were Quakers, yes. Yeah. So you think of integrity as being fixed, but Kenneth Barnes in well, a well-known English Quaker writing, I suppose, in the 1960s and 70s, said that he admired the integrity of the Dutch Quakers in the war when they had to lie to save Jews from the Germans. So... Now, that doesn't square with my earlier reference to Gandhi and the unity of ends and means right. on a, in a strict sense, but in wartime, of course, everything is tipped upside down. And I can see where, where he's coming from uh, because these people are putting their lives well, putting their lives on the line mm. to rescue people who are being persecuted and killed. So that that's a, that's a situation where the truth is not an absolute. You have mm. to make an ethical judgment. Yes. So on what basis do you make that ethical judgment? It's difficult for us in this situation <laughs> to imagine that, eh? For the good of everyone, for the good of somebody else, um, it's never an easy kind of choice to make, but even on, a, on an everyday basis, I think these choices come amongst people. Um, I suppose, sorry. I remember reading a book about a, <clears throat> a woman who decided she was going to be a very plain speaking Quaker. But she offended almost everybody she came in contact with, so she kept on shifting to different meetings. Now, I don't really think that's what we mean by straightforward speaking. And even the comments she put in her books, and it was about person, about the people. I don't think, well, it's certainly not the way we go about it with Quakers. I can think of another trivial example of plain speaking. Someone arrives at the home of a Quaker late at night. He's hungry and he's tired, and his host says, are you hungry? Would you like something to eat? And out of politeness, he says, no, I'm fine, thank you. And the other person, the Quaker host says, right, then you, I don't need to give you any food. Yeah, but, I was thinking about, you know, deciding whether something is ethical or not. I mean, just going back to my business of uh, makeup, I mean, that is to some degree a frivolous business. But it is also possible to buy cheap makeup from China, which is not perhaps so good for your skin. And actually, I come from a pharmacy background, so I know the constituents of the makeup, and some that may not be 
so good. So I was fairly careful, uh, very careful to, to sell makeup that was good for your skin and had not been tested on animals. So even a business like makeup can be conduct, conducted in an ethical manner. Hmm. I was thinking, Margaret, going back to that situation of whether you lie to save, to save someone's life in the situation with the Dutch people, mm. I guess that there's a, like a hierarchy of values, like thou shalt not kill, but thou shalt not, neither shalt thou aid or abet other people to do the same. And by covering up the fact that you knew where these people were, you were preventing someone else from killing, I guess. I don't know. Interesting. Well, I think we have to use our discretion, don't yes, we? Yes, I think so. For the good of everybody. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You, would, you, you had done an awful lot of work, Graham, on the history of Quaker businesses and enterprises. I just wonder whether you had anything more to add in that area. Well, one extreme example was Scott Bader, who actually decided to give his business to his employees. So who was Scott Bader? I don't know whether it was some sort of electronics business. I don't actually know much about the nature of the business. but uh... was he, he was a Quaker. Oh, he was a Quaker, yes. Right. Yes. He was referred to by um, E.F. Schumacher in his book, Small is Beautiful. And uh, Schumacher had quite an association with the Scott Bader enterprise, yeah. But I don't, I can't remember what Scott Bader, the company did. Um, anybody got anything else that they'd like to add before we draw this to a close? Okay, well, I'd like to thank our guests, Margaret, Graham and David, and thank you all for listening to our programme. Our next programme on the testimony of community will be broadcast at the same time, 9pm on Wednesday the 24th of January. If you want to find out more about Quakers, do visit our Quake City Quakers Facebook page or www.quaker.org.nz. We meet every Sunday at the Quaker Centre, 217 Ferry Road at 10.30am. You're welcome to join us. Until our next programme, I wish you all a wonderful Christmas and New Year. <laughs>